So Tim, non-terrestrial network's been a huge topic here at Mobile World Congress, but uh, maybe set the stage for us a little bit based on the research you and your colleagues at GSMA Intelligence do. What's the uh, state of play today? So the state of play today is that there's a lot of market momentum. Um, we track operators representing just over 70% uh, telco market share that now have at least one satellite partnership and often more than one. Um, and that number is growing at about 20 to 25 percentage points a year. So it's not going to be long until we have pretty much this as a completely global phenomenon. We're seeing activity now really moving towards a commercialization stage. Uh, and I think it's super exciting because as we go through the next sort of two or three years, you're going to start to see uh, more and more satellite service availability as part of uh, what the mobile operators can offer to their customers. Yeah, so uh, when we think about things like direct-to-device connectivity, how do you think about that as a revenue opportunity for operators? What's the consumer appetite to pay more for that type of service? Yeah, it, we've had a lot of interest on that question. So I think from the consumer side, there's sort of two avenues. One is you know, connecting people that don't have a phone because they're out of coverage. Uh, and two is really using it as, um, as a roaming tool um, to offer coverage anywhere in the country or for people who are traveling. Uh, when we ask consumers, 60% of people, 6 zero, say they would pay more uh, for satellite service. And if you do the math, you get to an average uplift that they say they would pay of around 8 or 9%. Um, so that may seem sort of minor, but actually when you scale it across a customer base, it's actually pretty significant. Uh, and, and from some of the plans we're, we're seeing out, come out from T-Mobile and other operators who are, who are offering this, uh, we think there's some, there's some nice opportunity there. Yeah, so if we think a little more long term, I guess we'll eventually get to ubiquitous connectivity, which necessarily implies a deep integration between terrestrial and non-terrestrial networks. As we progress towards that, what do you see as some of the major challenges that are going to need to be addressed through the industry? So there's a challenge uh, operationally of integrating the NTN networks with the terrestrial infrastructure. Things like switches and handovers, billing, um, how you monitor performance. Kind of the plumbing of side of things doesn't always get talked about, but has to get right for the service to work. Um, I think secondly, there's still some interesting challenges on the spectrum side. We're seeing, we had a big NTN event that we hosted yesterday um, and, and had you know, speakers from Starlink, SpaceX, uh, AST and others talking about this where you have you know, kind of mobile satellite spectrum versus um, terrestrially repurposed spectrum. And both of those kind of camps have trade-offs and I, I think we're still working through some of the challenges to make sure that the spectrum models work as they should. Yeah. You had an interesting slide, and I believe one bit of phrasing was 3G-like connectivity. Yeah. So, I mean, how do, we, how do we set reasonable expectations for those consumers that have expressed a willingness to pay for it, but, but you know, balance it with what can you know, technologically be delivered? Yeah, and, and we see this as an evolution. You know, right now, most of the services are offering sort of in the high single megabits per second or, or in the teens. So sort of what you'd get on a, on a 3G or 4G uh, connection. Um, but over time, we think that will transition to voice and eventually data connectivity, internet connectivity on the mobile. Um, to get there though, there is still a lot of kind of capacity that needs to be added in space uh, and some engineering improvements that are needed to be able to bring those speeds up. Uh, but for now, it's really proving the model and giving people the ability to have coverage wherever they are because we know for the telco operators, that's, that's still you know, the number one hygiene factor for, for doing a good job with their customers. Yeah. Can you give us a little insight into the market dynamics? I mean, I know we've seen a lot of consolidation on the satellite side, but then when we think about the 3GPD standardization process, it seems like there's an opportunity to kind of drive the price point down by standardizing it through a you know, telco type approach. For sure, and, and I think one of the big um, turning points for this whole uh, space, excuse the pun, was that uh, NTN standards were uh, enshrined in, in, in the 5G near radio. Uh, so now you have a situation where 
there is compatibility across a much larger range of devices, um, which does bring the price point down because you have a scale economy. We're seeing that with IoT as well, another key part of this opportunity with release 18. So I think the, 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 the extent of, of common standards is actually a really important part of the conversation. Uh, and you can see that by the amount of partnerships that are being formed and, the, and indeed the GSMA's own NTN community, uh, which is tasked with, with, with helping that effort. Yeah, so as the engineering challenges get worked out and the capabilities improve, I'm kind of curious about the testing of the whole thing because, I mean, very difficult thing to do when we think about Doppler shifts, when we think about the long orbital times yeah. for LEOs, but yeah. just uh, frame that out for us. Yeah, so there's a lot of advanced testing that goes on um, from a number of specialist providers now that work with Constellation uh, providers and, and indeed the telco operators. And what they're doing, as you say, is they're testing to make sure it works as it should, uh, but they're also testing things like intelligent beam formation and other um, very advanced uh, routing technology that is needed to make sure the spectrum is operating where it's allowed to. Uh, and to make sure that the signal is getting where it needs to go. Uh, obviously, the laws of physics can't be overcome, so things like Doppler and rain fade will always be there, uh, but it's a question of really optimizing the service given that environment, and, and there's actually been a lot of progress there. So give us a, a kind of summary thought here that would uh, give us some realistic expectations, you know, that, that art of the practical versus the art of the possible. What, what can we think about in the next two or three years? Well, we, in the short term, I think what you're going to see is just more commercialization, more operators partnering with satellite services and bringing those to market. We've seen Verizon, Vodafone, AT&T, NTT, KDDI, the list goes on, who are now moving into this as a... Uh, a competitive advantage and, and I think it will become something of uh, a normality in a few years to have that. So I think the next two or three years are about commercialization, deploying the service, and, and then it's really monetizing and, and commercial execution. We think there is a $30 billion addressable revenue opportunity for the telco operators here by 2035 per year, um, and that's very material. Uh, so I think with the consumer and the business and IoT, and indeed the defense side of that, there's, there's a lot of um, runway to look at. Well, you and your colleagues at GSMA Intelligence are putting out some really valuable research on the space, and I appreciate you taking a few minutes to summarize yeah. it for me. Pleasure. So Antonio, I'm really excited to catch up with you here on the GSMA Pavilion at Mobile World Congress. Um, kind of before we get into the activities that European Space Agency is engaged in with GSMA, maybe just tell us a little bit about your role and your responsibilities within the organization. Sure, with pleasure. Uh, I'm uh, here, working at the European Space Agency within the Director of Telecommunications, where I'm at the head of space for 5G, 6G non-terrestrial networks. I mean, I coordinate all activities to do with the integration between terrestrial and non-terrestrial networks. Tell us a little bit about what's going on on the stand here behind us. you got some really cool stuff. Yeah, we're very happy. We showcase some of our industrial uh, partner work that we do together. We have two or three very interesting and innovative applications here. You can see a car moving here on the back. This is our NTN connected car. It's an example of uh, an end-to-end non-terrestrial network connection where we have a full 5G Netto here underneath the plinth, and, they, and, and then we have a wireless connection to the car, which is being controlled remotely through our non-terrestrial network. It's an emulation of what satellite can do for the for the world of uh, 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 driverless car and autonomous cars. All right. What are we looking at up here? All right. This is our new satellite. We're going to launch a first 6G in-orbit laboratory. It's a six units uh, CubeSat. Uh, built by one of our uh, UK manufacturers, will be launched next year and will be the first 6G satellite. In other words, creating a laboratory in orbit which will allow our partners, mobile network operators, or satellite network operators, and technology suppliers to test new advanced 6G features. Then I believe you've also got a video feed set up that kind of takes us into the <coughs> facility in Germany where uh, astronauts train, right? Yes, we do indeed. For the guests here in Barcelona, we have a live video feed over uh, the operational one web constellation of satellites. And this live video feed brings us straight into our, into our Luna facility in Germany where our astronauts, European astronauts train and uh, develop their skills before going in orbit. And uh, we have regular updates. Uh, this is very popular. Uh, 
part of our showcase here. We had uh, the Spanish astronaut here live on stage, and we have a couple of our other astronauts in Germany in our clone facility to uh, uh, relate and uh, um, dialogue with the public here through our live satellite connection. And then now let's talk about what you're doing with GSMA Foundry. Some of our colleagues kind of took me through the big three challenge areas, and I think this is going to be really interesting to our audience. So maybe you can just break those down for us. Sure, we are very, very happy to stay here at the GSMA Foundry Pavilion. We have a very, very good and strong partnership with the GSMA Foundry. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started our relationship and we decided that we have so much in common and with so much complementary function in bringing the two communities together. So through the GSMA Foundry and our 5G6G hub in the UK, we are able to launch new challenges and make, make use of European uh, ESA funding mechanism to uh, uh, promote new innovation in the convergence between terrestrial and non-terrestrial network. In particular this year, together with the GSMA Foundry, we are launching three new challenges. Uh, the first challenge is on 6G, so develop uh, technology and application moving from 5G to 6G. This is very important and very innovative in a kind of R&D area. The second challenge we have is to do with our 5G hub and the 6G foundry hubs to develop application and technology which can be deployed and displayed uh, at our joint hubs and labs. And finally, uh, very important for us is the direct-to-device. A lot of people in Mobile World Congress talk about direct-to-device. So our third challenge is about direct-to-device, to solicit uh, ideas and application and, and innovation into the area of uh, direct-to-device, where device can be your headset, but a device could also be considered as a car, so to provide direct connectivity to cars, uh, to mobile uh, things, and to, of course, to people as well. And I know you all are actively collaborating across uh, academia, industry, and uh, at the governmental level. So for anybody that wants to get involved, what opportunities are there? Yeah, there are huge opportunities. We have, uh, as part of the European Space Agency, we manage hundreds of millions of euros in the space telecommunication area on behalf of the various ESA member states. So it's very easy to get in touch with us in order to ask uh, funding uh, opportunity, but also to get technology support, regulatory support in the space field. And this challenge is just one of the mechanisms we use to allow people to access through the GSMA Foundry website, access ESA and ESA funding. So it's very easy to go, for example, to the GSMA Foundry website, look for the challenges, and from there submit what we call an expression of interest. That would be the first step to access uh, the ESA funding. This challenges event will be uh, celebrated, hopefully the next Mobile World Congress 2026, where we'll be able to uh, display the results of this joint collaboration between ESA and GSMA Foundry. Antonio, very good. I really appreciate you taking the time to fill us in on the good work you and your colleagues at ESA are doing. Thank you very much. We really appreciate being here. We are very thankful to GSMA Foundry for this strong collaboration, and we look forward to continue to support this wide audience in the next years to come. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.